We'll be in Ezekiel chapter 3 uh, a little later on in the message. And then, uh, where's the other one? Daniel chapter 12. Uh, like I said, when we begin this study, uh, you've got to look at a lot of Old Testament prophecy do a proper study on the book of Revelation. Uh, the, the, book of, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, you know, we've already looked at some places in Isaiah. We're going to look at some different things tonight. Uh, Zechariah, uh, we'll get there. We ain't, we ain't really got to that part yet. But uh, you've got to look at all these things because Scripture interprets Scripture. Uh, these, are, these are things that we need to see. So when we say, okay, we think this is what he's talking about, the reason why is because back here that's what he was talking about. And, and uh, John's, I think, I think John sees a lot that these Old Testament prophets has already saw. For example, you know, we've already talked about with the, with the cherubim and the seraphim around the throne room singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. You know, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw that exact same thing. They were singing the same words, doing the same stuff. So, I mean, we can use that as an interpretation, a device, when we look at that vision to see what John saw in his vision to help us understand that. And that's what we're going to do with Ezekiel and Daniel tonight as well, and, and then some various other verses. Uh, before we start, we're going to, uh, prayer concerns. Uh, Greg's mother is doing fine uh, from her procedure last week, but she currently still is waiting on test results, so continue to pray for her. Uh, Mark McKinney was supposed to have had soldier, shoulder surgery yesterday and, or, or today. But anyway, they delayed it. It's going to be a couple more weeks, uh, August 2nd or August 3rd, something like that. Doctor had something, I, I don't know, he just, he just said they put it off. So, so that, it was supposed to be yesterday, so that didn't happen. So keep Mark in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, Barry Devine and Maxine uh, Devine, that, that was the uh, interim pastor when I came here, uh, uh, Barry and Maxine have had COVID, so continue to pray for them. Uh, David Woodruff, my uncle, Uncle Bill, some of y'all know un Uncle Bill from Mexico Mission Work. Uh, Uncle Bill was put in the hospital yesterday. Uh, he's been taking some uh, chemotherapy treatments. He's had cancer for a long time. Even when we was going to Mexico and he was going with us, he, he went anyway. Uh, he, uh, he's, he's, he's a tough old bird. Uh, but, uh, but anyway... Uh, Pray for him because he he got put in the hospital yesterday. He's got he's got blood in his urine, and uh, and and plus he's got chemo and he just got over COVID for the third time. So pray for Uncle Bill. He's 80 years old, uh, and and he still works every day. I mean, <laughs> he's a machine. But but pray for Uncle Bill because because uh, my aunt Jen. Uh, had a stroke several years ago, and she's not mobile. And if something happens to Uncle Bill, I don't know what Aunt Jen's going to do. Uh, uh, they have one daughter that lives right down the street from them, but that just uh, uh, be a, it's a hard scene with Bill in the hospital anyway, you know, because uh, the, the two daughters have to kind of split the work. And one of the daughters, her husband's the pastor of Macedonia Baptist Church down on 150. So, you know, being in ministry, what that entails. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Uh, Helen Norman has been moved to a uh, rehab, uh, is doing good uh, from her hip replacement. Uh, she's been moved to a rehab somewhere in South Carolina. Uh, Patricia has uh, the contact information. Uh, if somebody would like to send her some cards besides what the church is already sending, uh, if you'd like to. Uh, Hilda Minton is uh, still in rehab up in uh, Burke County. Uh, she actually uh, uh, said that she appreciates all the cards the church has been sending her. Just keep praying for Hilda. Uh, and uh, keep those thoughts coming and uh, that kind of thing. I'm sorry? Yeah. 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 Yes. If you don't know what, she, she had a bunch of steel parts put in her leg and her body rejected them and it got infected and stayed infected and she was in and out of the hospital. She'd been out of the hospital almost a year now. And uh, so they finally went there and took all that metal out. And they got to get the infection completely know for sure it's dead before they can even put any parts back in. So one of her legs, she don't have a knee or nothing. She's in a rehab. And what she's doing in the rehab is they're teaching her how to kind of, they put a board up there and teaching her how to kind of push and slide down that board to get in a chair and that kind of stuff. So uh, that's, that's also very laborious. On, I mean, that, that's, especially when you're weak from infection and all that, that's a, that's a very hard labor. Uh, I'm sorry? 
Yes, yeah, Stephen, uh, Judy's son was put in the hospital today, dehydrated. I, I, didn't, I didn't follow up with that. That was late this evening when I saw that. Huh? Okay. So pray for Stephen. What else? What else? Winnie Hodge? Recovering from emergency appendicitis. Yeah. Then when it's when it's emer- they say it's more painful on the recovery when they have to emergency do it too. Well, that's good. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Yeah. I had a pastor buddy had one. Uh, he was he wasn't in the will of God, and he partook of the Lord's Supper unworthily. And the next week, his appendix busted inside of him. Uh, I, I'm used to just uh, sound like Charlie Brown, school teacher in the other room. I don't ever know what she says. Sue Hester. Oh yeah. Yeah, that came out this week, too. Lee, that, that's your aunt and Krista Dellinger's daughter's great aunt? Okay. Yeah, pray for Phil Goins. Uh, y'all, most of y'all know Phil. Uh, he'll actually be preaching here the second night of our revival and playing bass guitar in the group that's going to lead worship. Uh, his sister had a stroke earlier in the week. She died the next day, and... Uh, he, he'll be pre- he's going to be preaching her funeral too Saturday evening so pray for Phil I, I went and saw him a little bit yesterday he, he took it pretty hard uh, pretty hard she was uh, 57 so she wasn't an old lady to you young folks that might seem old but to me at, at 56 that's just not an old person okay She was here Sunday morning, wasn't she? Yeah, they were. I thought she was here. That is right. But but yeah, they were. I thought she was here. She didn't even mention it. Okay, Joy Garen, Michael Garen's grandmother. Uh, they found some sales in. I'm, I'm repeating this because of the internet. Uh, Patricia watches on the internet, by the way. That's how she gets all this, and it goes in the bulletin. Uh, she may be at the close closet tonight. I don't know. She passed the COVID quarantine. She's still quarantined. She didn't have it, but her son did, and he was in her house. So that's why she wasn't here Sunday, if you didn't know that. Anyway, yeah, okay. So Joy Garen, Michael's grandmother, they found cells in her esophagus. There weren't pre, what they call pre-cancers, or just weren't cancers? Pre-cancers. Okay. So pray for her. But she was here Sunday. She didn't even mention it. Okay. And obviously the Peru team, uh, we all got to pass a COVID test Saturday, uh, Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock or you can't go. <laughs> we got to pass a COVID test Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Huh? We'll see. What about the morgue? Did they find him? Still ain't found him. So the family of Quentin Rourke and him and his well-being. Yes, Stacy. Who? Oh, okay, I know who you're talking about now. And he's got cancer. Chris Wilson. Are you waving at me up there? Yeah, I know you mentioned uh, Judy's son, Steve. Did you all know that Judy and his, his son, Alex? Uh, uh, I don't know the details. All I know is he's having surgery Friday in Charlotte. So, Stephen and his son. Okay, so Stephen, Judy's son that we just was talking about, it's admitted to the hospital. Also, his son, Alex, which would be Judy's grandson, 
is going to have surgery Friday. You just don't know what. I'm thankful Patricia washes and writes all this down. She don't. She calls you. She asks me sometimes. She's like, I heard part of it, you know, because sometimes people all in the back of the room. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, you speak Charlie Brown school teacher? Is that all? Hey, Randy. How you doing, brother? Pray for Randy. Oh, no. Uh, Vertigo can be severe, man. I, man, I'd make you. I've had that. Reminded me of them old vodka days. Like you got off one of them things that you get on that goes round and round real fast and the bottom falls out of it and you stick to the wall. You ever rode that? You never rode that? A lot of fun. Right up until the person beside of you throws up and it hits you in the face. Pray for Michelle. She's had vertigo all week. Uh, and, yeah, that, that, and she's been to the doctor already, but uh, still yet continue to pray for her. That's a bad scene, especially if it's prolonged day after day. Because it gets old. What else? You've had it before, Bert, Crystal? I've had it a couple times, but I don't like it. Hey, Terry, how you doing? How, you got an update on John? Right. Right. You talk to him, too? Yeah, you. Okay. Pray for John Black. He's got cancer and... Uh, in his spine, they just giving him uh, radiation or chemo, one or the other, basically for his pain, just to keep the pain level down. Pray for him. Pray for Eunice. Uh, my, they've had a Johnny's been sick the whole time I've known him, and that's ten years. Yep. Everybody ready to pray? You got a what? Unmentionables. Okay. Unmentionables. Lunchables. Y'all ready to pray now? Man, that's a lot. A lot of stuff. A lot of people. A lot of different things. Folks hurting. Sick. Recovering from surgery. Facing surgery. Cancer. I hate cancer. I hate cancer almost as bad as I do the devil. Almost. I think that's where its origin came from anyway. Cancer. I hate cancer. I hate to anybody even say they got cancer. It's horrible. It's just horrible. It's horrible. Horrible thing. But statistics show one out of every three women, one out of every two men will have some form of cancer in their lifetime. Which means half the men in this room and a third of the women in this room will have some form of cancer in, in their lifetime. And that's probably a pretty accurate statement if we look around the room. I mean, both of y'all have had it. Mary Jane? Yeah. yeah. Well, if you do the math, that's about a third. Stacy, you've had it. Any other dudes? Y'all had it? Yep, David had it. Well, we're doing pretty better on the dude side in this room right now. So praise the Lord for that. That's a mess. All right, let's pray. Lord, we come to you tonight. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for grace, mercy, love, and your control. Lord, as we talk about the things that we've talked about tonight, man, it, I pray for every one of the family members connected to every one of these people because 
it just hurts to watch people in our families hurt, whether it be from COVID or cancer or just to have to recover from surgery or to just to have a, a, an ear imbalance. Uh, when, when people we love go through things, it hurts. It's hard on us. So, Lord, we pray that, that, that uh, you would bring healing and comfort and help uh, all the family members of all the people infected or affected be, uh, just be touched. Give them, give them peace. Give them mercy. Give them love. Uh, these that are awaiting surgery, we pray that everything goes smooth. We pray for these that have already had surgery that healing would be quick and efficient and uh, pain-free as possible. And, uh, Lord, we pray, Lord, for protection. Uh, we pray, Lord, for, uh, for souls. Uh, we pray, Lord, for uh, these tests that have to be passed Sunday. And, uh, Lord, we pray for our trip, for our airplanes to go up and come down when and where and how they're supposed to, and uh, for the buses to run smooth and for all the materials to get where it needs to be and for hearts to be prepared. Uh, we pray, Lord, as we prepare for this coming Sunday, even to worship here, Lord, that our hearts are prepared for worship and uh, for the gospel. And, uh, Lord, just help us this week as we continue to work on our personal testimonies. Uh, Lord, help us to, to hear from you and to, to work through that in such a way that it would be an effective way to tell someone else about you. Be with our time tonight. And, uh, Lord, just help us to honor you tonight in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody working on your testimony? Everybody working on your testimony for Sunday? I'm not going to say, hey, raise your hand. I'm going to say, hey, read yours. I told you wouldn't nobody come Sunday. <laughs> Work on that. This is a really, really, really simple way to share the gospel in such a way that nobody can't take it away from you. I mean, because it can't nobody say, hey, Mike, that didn't happen to you. I mean, who would do that? Jesus changed my life. This day I was a dead man walking. This day I was a resurrected new life in Christ, and something's different. Who would say, no, that didn't happen? I mean, who would really say that to you? It'd take a lot of nerve for somebody to say that, wouldn't it? Because they'd basically just be saying you as a liar and the Holy Spirit was a liar. It'd take a lot of nerve for somebody to do that. <laughs> Work on them. Call me if you have a problem. Work on them. If you wasn't here Sunday, there's some bulletins I think left out there. It's got a, a template out there uh, to help you with that. And you can always go to Facebook and watch the sermon for Sunday. And, and hear all the steps and the teaching and, and the whole thing that goes with it. Again, even if you was here Sunday, if you're struggling with how to do it, go back and watch it. It's on Facebook Live. That's all you got to do. All right. I'm sorry? And YouTube. And YouTube. It don't come down off of YouTube either. Okay? So, yep. There you go. Tonight, a recommissioning of the Great Commission. A recommissioning of the Great Commission. We've covered the seven churches, we've covered the seven seals, four of which were the four horsemen, and we've covered six out of the seven trumpets. And just like between the sixth and the seventh seals, there was that time of interlude, now we sort of see the same thing between trumpet six and trumpet seven. Now when we get to the bowls between six and seven, there's no interlude. And the reason why, as you're going to see tonight, is this passage ends in verse 11. He says, the, or it's not verse 11, it's before we even get to verse 11. He says, there is no more delay. In other words, when what happens, happens when the next trumpet sounds, this stuff's going to uh, move a lot more rapidly to the, to the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, the next few chapters, what happens is going to move. It's, it's not going to be like, you know, we've paced out, and, and uh, sort of seems like time lost in, in some way. But, you know, we're really about three and a half years into tribulation right now at this point in the text. Seventeen sermons in, but three and a half years into the tribulation time. Okay? I counted them. Seven, this is sermon 17. All right. Read with me. And I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open. And he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice 
as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up these things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be, here it is, that there would be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished. And as he preached to his servants, the prophets, then the voice which I heard from heaven I heard again, speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter But in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The main idea tonight, central truth if you will, is in the midst of catastrophic judgment, God gives a commission to proclaim his word to the nations. I want you to think on that a minute. That's been the message the whole time. That the Word of God would be proclaimed to the nations. It's been that way the whole time. All the way back in the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, the final words of Jesus, Go therefore and make disciples. Acts 1-8, right before He ascends into heaven in verse 9, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Even in the midst of tribulation, with all that's happened, there's another commissioning to go and proclaim the gospel. Not literally to the nations, but to peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That includes everybody. Go proclaim the gospel. This chapter focuses on three things. There's this mighty angel at the beginning, this little scroll or this little book, and then this recommissioning to proclaim the word. First of all, let's look at the angel. Look at verse 1. And the angel's coming down out of the clouds. This is kind of opposite to what we saw last week with these angels coming up out of the abyss. These, these were, those were fallen angels. Those were demons. Those locusts, all that mess coming up. See, that, they're coming up out of the abyss. These angels, these are coming down. So we know these ain't demons. They're coming down out of the clouds. They're coming, he's coming down out of heaven. And I want you to notice he has four, he's clothed with four things. Well, there's four statements about him, actually. Two of them are garments. The first one is that he's clothed in a cloud. He is clothed in a cloud. And I saw another angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud. In Scripture, when we see clouds, we we, we think of two things. Not just, you know, in the sky, but when we think of Scripture and interpretation, thinking about prophecy, we think of two things. The first thing is the presence of God. When the Bible talks about a cloud, we we think about the presence of God. What do I mean? Uh, Is uh, Exodus 19 on the screen? Exodus 19, 9. Exodus 19, 9. The Bible says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you, may also believe in you forever. Moses told the words of the people of the Lord. In Exodus 13, verse 21. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of the cloud by day to lead them on the way in a pillar of fire by night. The idea of this cloud, it's the presence of God. When Moses would go up on the mountain, the Bible says that the cloud came down. They were thundering and lightning and, and rock and roll and all this stuff going on. And the people didn't get close because they was afraid. 
They, 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 they even said, hey, Moses, you go up for us. We, we, we don't want to go up there. We're scared. <laughs> they were afraid to go into the presence of the Lord. So the cloud was symbolic of the presence of the Lord. And then in this verse that you see on the screen, the, the cloud was the presence of God. It led them around. And they didn't See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't act like He does in the New Testament. After Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in the heart of the believer. We become the tabernacle of God. In that day, the cloud and the pillar of fire was above the tabernacle of, of God. They'd set that movable tabernacle up, and that cloud was right above it in the daytime. And at night, it was burning with fire right above that tabernacle. And when God wanted them to move, the cloud moved. And when the cloud moved, they'd pack all that stuff up. Head towards that cloud. When the cloud stopped, they'd set that thing back up again. It was symbolic of the presence of the Lord, wherever it was at. This cloud, this, this presence of God hanging out over top of wherever the temple was, which is symbol, symbol, or the tabernacle, which is symbolic of the presence of the Lord. The second thing we see associated with clouds in the Bible all, all has to do with Jesus. When we, when we think about the ascension of Jesus in, into the heavens in, in Acts 1-9, I was alluding to that a minute ago, but I have it on a slide. Uh, after, after he had said these things, what did he just said? But you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's verse 8. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of sight. Even though the cloud in the Old Testament was the presence of the Lord here and there, but, but in the New Testament, even though the cloud was the presence of the Lord, the clouds where the presence of the Lord went. When He ascended, He ascended into this cloud, this place. This pre How cool would that have been to saw that? How cool would that have been? But it's also associated with Jesus', Jesus return in Matthew chapter 24. The Bible says, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming where? In the clouds. And I didn't allude to none of Paul's writings, but, uh, but, but, but uh, just, just, for a, just to give you a, a whistle wetter here. Uh, Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Then we who are aligned and remain will be called up together with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always comfort one another with these words. Again, this idea of when you think about a cloud in Scripture, it's the presence of... So this angel that's coming down that John sees here, if he's wearing a cloud, the whole idea is he's been in the presence of the Lord. He's been where Jesus is. That's where he came from. He, he's, he's coming down. Uh, and the second thing we see is that he is clothed with the rainbow upon, upon his head. Now, the rainbow, does everybody remember what the rainbow was originally? It ain't got nothing to do with homosexuals, just in case you don't know. <laughs> it's promise. It was the sign of the promise. The sign of the covenant promise given to Noah. When they got off the boat, they made a sacrifice, and God made a promise. It was an unconditional covenant. Had no conditions on Noah's side. All the conditions were on God. And he was told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's a forerunner of the Great Commission. Because he wasn't just told to fill the earth with people. The idea was he was supposed to fill the earth with worshipers. Just like uh, John Selhammer wrote of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where it was to cultivate and till. In Hebrew, those words could be translated as worship and obey. It's that idea is to fill the earth with worshipers. Uh, Genesis 9 13 says, And I set my, my bow in the cloud, and it shall be the sign for the covenant between me and the earth. And I want you to think about a bow. You know, a bow, bow's like, a rainbow's like this. I saw one yesterday evening. It didn't rain at my house, but I could see where it did rain over in, on the horizon. And there's a rainbow over there. You know, rainbow's like this, right? Right? Okay, if you put an arrow in that, bro, in that bow, where's the arrow pointing? So what God was saying in that covenant was, is again, these conditions are on me. I'm not going to break this. All the conditions are on me. So when we think about a rainbow, 
in light of this angel coming down, if you remember back in chapter 4, verse 3 of Revelation, we see this throne room appearance. And the Bible says, He who was sitting, the guy sitting on the throne, verse 2, He was sitting, was like jasper and stone, and in Sardis in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne. Again, the angel has been in the presence of the Lord. He's coming down. He's been in the presence. But not only that, what he says is based, I believe, because it was a rainbow, I believe it has something to do with the faithfulness to the promise of God as the angel comes down. So he's clothed. He's coming in a cloud. He's got this rainbow above his head. Number three, this is not a garment, but it is a description of an angel. The Bible says that his face shone like the sun. Again, this is symbolic of this angel being in the presence of the Lord. Do you remember, remember Moses? Moses would go into the tabernacle. He would hang out with the Lord. He would come out. People were scared of him. He was shining like the sun. The Bible says he literally he had to wear a veil. But, but now the veil was, wasn't because people were scared of him. Um, we, so I've heard preachers teach that, and I might have even been guilty of that a long, long, long time ago before I really got deep into Scriptures. But, 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 but the New Testament gives us a little bit better translation of that. The whole idea is, is, is uh, Moses didn't want the people to see the glory of God fade from him. He was their leader. He was their leader. They, he wanted them to know he had been... When I speak... I've been in the presence of the Lord, you know. Not that, hey, I'm Moses and you've got to listen, but no, I, I've, what I'm about to tell you is coming from somebody higher up the chain. He didn't want people to know. So when his glory started fading, he wore a veil, so people couldn't tell that his glory is fading. But, but this angel, the Bible says that this angel's face shone like the sun. In Exodus uh, 34, 29, I don't know if you can read all this. It's, it's, it, this is the most I can get on a slide. But it t- explains about what I just said. Moses came down from Sinai and had the tablets and, and, and his hand was coming down. And, and Moses did not know that the skin on his face shone. When it first happened, he didn't even know. He didn't know he was lit up like a Christmas tree. I mean, he'd been up there with God. Nobody, you know, they didn't have a mirror. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Back in that day, what they would have had would have been a piece of polished metal. They didn't even have what we have as a mirror today. He didn't know. You know, he couldn't look at his phone and, you know, see if he's higher. He, 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 he didn't know. So when he came down and the people were afraid of him, I was like, what the heck's going on? And, and, and so and you have that whole thing there. And in verse 33, right in here, when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went out before the Lord to speak with him, he had taken the veil off until he came out. Whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, so on and so forth. He had been in the presence of the Lord, this angel, All of these things are describing someone who's been in the presence of the Lord. Jesus. Jesus himself. Matthew 17, 2. He was transfigured before Peter, James, and John on the mountain. And and the Bible says, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. I believe they got to see what we read about back here in chapter 1. What John sees in chapter 1, I think he had already seen it. I think he saw it on the Mount of Transfiguration back that Matthew talks about. Because in, in, here in, in, chapter, uh, in chapter 1, verse 16, the Bible says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. So when John saw this, he had done seen this before. When Peter saw it, he fell down. He got up. He started making places to, to worship. He started making tabernacles for Moses, for Elijah. He didn't know what to do. But see, John had already saw this. So when he sees it on Patmos, he sees the glorified Lord. He had already seen him. Now he sees him again. And now he's with him. <laughs> he, got, he got a pre-runner. He got a precursor. Again, the whole thing's the presence of the Lord. And fourth, look what the angel... I spelled that wrong on my notes. It says angle. <laughs> the angle's feet. Let me fix that. Just so I'll know when I get home. Change my notes. In case I ever teach this again. The angle's feet. It's a 90 degree angle's feet. Is the angel's feet. 
They were like pillars of fire. Now, again, with Jesus, back in chapter 1, what John saw in verse 15 was somewhat like this when he saw Jesus then. His feet were like burnished bronze, which is made to glow as if it was in the furnace. This idea, he, what he sees is he's seeing somebody that has been in the presence of the Lord. But it's not only that. If you remember back when we did chapter 1, the idea of his feet being like that was symbolic of judgment of holiness and uncompromising stability because it's his feet. He, he, you know, think about uh, the, the armor of God in Ephesians 6. You know, when, when Paul talks about the soldier's feet, they're, they're shod with the gospel, but, but, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's I'm standing firm. You can't move me. I can't, you know, you, you can't, you know, think about a football guy where they run into them things and push them down through there, them big foam rubber things on rails. You can't, you ain't moving. You ain't like that. You can't do me like that. I, I'm, I'm standing firm on what I, So when you think about this angel, this angel's stable. He's, he's holy. And not only is he talking about being in the presence of God, period, as being in the presence of God, we think of God a whole lot as, as you know, God is love. But equally, God is judge. And in that, by this time, by last week, remember last week? God ain't playing no more. <laughs> I mean, there, His grace and mercy only goes so far. There's coming a day. There's coming a day that they won't. Uh, for unbelievers, it's going to be too late. There's coming a day when it when when you they've pushed it too far. Well, all that was verse one. Let's look at verse two now. <laughs> the angel, the angel had a little. The angel had a little book in his hand. I'm going to come back to that. He's standing with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. Uh, again, think about a conqueror. Uh, uh, Psalm 24 on the screen. Psalm 24, 1 and 2. The, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell at it. For He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. This angel comes down. He's got one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. What's he saying? Think about a conqueror. You ever, uh, uh, the old deal where they'd go out and battle when they got done, they'd, and you, you, you stab you, 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 uh, your flag in the ground. It's mine. You lay claim. The moon, the guy who walked on the moon, when they got there, we is the first ones there. What'd they do? They stabbed the flag in the ground, whether you believe that was real or not, because it flapped or not, all that. I've been to the Kennedy Space Center. I've heard all the arguments. Yeah, whatever you believe on that, whether it's a conspiracy or whether it was real, or whether it was Star Wars and done in a studio, whatever you think on that, regardless, we laid claim to it whether we was really there or not. It's ours, all right? So... <laughs> That's the idea of this angel, though. He's laying claim. What's he doing? He's been in the presence of the Lord. He's speaking on behalf of the king. And not only is he firm, and he's, he's the firm, and not only is he uncompromising and stable and the judge, <laughs> it's over both the land and the sea. And I'm going to come back to the little book. I'm coming back to the little book. So, so don't, don't forget about the little book. The evil one has been given liberty to reign over the earth, though. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, remember, they were told to be fruitful, multiply, and rule over the earth. Noah wasn't told to rule. They lost that right. Sin cost us the ability of mankind to rule over the earth until the end. Satan has liberty. You would think, as some places in Scripture even says he has the authority to rule. But when you read passages like Job, we find out that he's on a short lease. He can only do what God allows him to do, Job 1 and 2. He has to go, and God says, well, okay, you can do that, but you, that's as far as you can go. You know, uh, Peter, they were sitting there the night before Jesus was arrested. He looks at Peter and says, hey, Satan's asked, he could, and he's, not just, he's speaking with Peter because he's in the conversation, but I think he's talking to all the apostles. And he says, hey, look, Satan has asked, could he sift you guys like wheat? In other words, you thinking to have a test here. <laughs> You've been walking around with me for three years. You know, tomorrow's going to be a test. 
And nobody was at the cross but John. Nobody. That tells you the level of grace of our Lord. He knows who we are. He knows how we are. But the angels lay in claim that Jesus is in now... Uh, the control is still over the authority of King Jesus. He has laid claim over the earth and the sea. And then the angel stands on both and he gives this big shout. The Bible says it's as loud like when a lion roars. You ever heard a lion roar? Really? Yeah, it ain't like a bobcat, okay? I tell you what, I don't want to run a rabbit. Uh, I was up in Daniel Boone one time in the, in the Pisgah National Forest. I was up there one time deer hunting. <laughs> I was a young guy. I mean, young guy. Back then, it wasn't a lot of deer around here. You had to go to the mountains to hunt. Hugo helped us. Hurricane Hugo helped us with our deer. But regardless of that, I was up there one morning, walked in, had a flashlight, <laughs> went in there and sat down right at daylight. It's shrill. It's a daggum cougar is what it was. It's dark. All I know is I turned my light off because <laughs> he'd done found me and I didn't know where he was at. And I was praying for the daylight. I was praying for the sun to come up. <laughs> I sat right there against my tree. <laughs> I didn't even climb it. I sat right there. <laughs> and just that, and, and a cougar's nothing close to the size of a lion. Nothing even close. Man, hair stood up on my neck. Throughout Scripture, the voice of the Lord is often compared to a lion's roar, though. In the Old Testament, in Hosea 11.10, the Bible says, And they will walk after the Lord, and He will roar like a lion. Indeed, He will roar. He will roar. And in Joel chapter 3, uh, I think it's verse 16, not John 3.16, Joel 3.16, the Lord roars from Zion, and He utters His voice from Jerusalem. So, so, so this idea, again... Is the angel speaking for the Lord? When he hears what he, when he shouts, is he speaking for the Lord? I think so. And at this point, when he shouts, the Bible says there's seven peals of thunder that speak. And John states, when they spoke, he was about to write down what they said. Whatever he heard them say, he was about to write that in the book, in what we have here. However, heaven said to seal that up. Don't write that down. They don't need to know that. Now, now I, think with me a minute. We can only speculate, right? We can't. I, I, I read several commentaries here just to kind of see what folks thought. We can only speculate here. Uh, the former director of the Gospel Hour, Oliver Green, here's what he said. He said, Already set before us are blood, tears, famine, heartache, heartbreak, killing, misery, hell, fire, burning mountains, demon monstrosities, men begging to die and are unable to do so. Surely what John was forbidden to write must have been beyond human imagination and understanding. With everything that's already happened, whatever that was, must have been pretty bad. Or maybe, maybe not. John was just clear. Here's what we know. John was clearly told, don't write that. That's all we know. I mean, we don't have... We can speculate all we want to, whether it's really bad something or whatever it was. Some say it's as bad as it will be, but it could be worse. In other words, in other words, the things that have, that are already foretold that will happen, and the things that he goes on that we ain't got to yet that are foretold beyond that that will happen, it could have been worse. And God was just gracious at this point and said, "Eh, no, we ain't gonna do that." <laughs> I mean, we just don't know. You, we can look at it in all kind of ways. But the truth is, is we just don't know. Here's what we do know. Just like today. You ever feel like God's leading you to do something, but you ain't got all the details? You ever had that happen to you? I've, I felt like God was leading me to do things before, and I'm like, okay, God, give me the whole plan. He's like, no. You just come on. <laughs> you start following, and I'll fill you in as we go. 
<laughs> you know, it's kind of like Google. You know, you put your address in, you don't really know where you're going. You, it just kind of tells you to go as you go. You know, turn here. In three and a half miles, turn there. And then when you get there, it ain't even the place you put in. That's happened to me, really. <laughs> God's the same way. That's what we do know about this. We don't have to know all the details. We don't really have to know that to, to interpret the text. But I think it is kind of curious to what was what what was it that that they couldn't that he couldn't write it. Verse five. The angel straddling the earth and the sea. Then he lifts his right hand to heaven and he swears by him who lives forever. Why? Because there's nobody greater he could swear by. You know, in the, in, in the New Testament, the Pharisees would swear by. Uh, Jesus even got on them by taking false oaths. They, they would swear by the people or swear by the altar or swear by the temple or, you know, you've heard people do it today. I swear on my mama's grave, you know, that kind of thing. No, 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 no. This angel, I swear by the one who lives forevermore. Look what he says. He goes on to say he is the creator of everything. Who, who, we know who he's talking about. And then he goes on, look, look what he says next, and this is what I was alluding to earlier. There will no longer be a delay. No more. No more delay. No more slowing this thing down. See, no more interludes, if you will. No more intermission. But this picture to me, when he has him raise his, it, it brought to my mind a courtroom. You know, you go in, put your hand on the Bible, you know, you swear you tell the whole truth. Nothing but the truth to so help you, God. You know, that, that, you, you, ever, you ever had to do that? I'm the only one in the whole room that's ever had to do that. Okay, some of you had to do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, swearing an oath is not something new to modern day courtrooms, uh, it's not even something new to the Greek people. You know, this goes all the way back to the law of God. In Deuteronomy 32, 40. I lift up my hand to heaven and I say, I live forever. What's he doing? He's swearing an oath to the one. You know, God even swears by himself in the scripture. He has nothing else to swear to. I mean, what, what, what can he swear to? He's God. That he will keep his word. Now, here's where I need you to turn to Daniel 12, verse 7. Daniel 12, verse 7. I have two verses or three I want you to see in Daniel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. You should be familiar with Daniel because you should have just read it recently in your Bible reading plan. Not like this week, but recently. In Daniel 7, listen to the words. And I heard the man dressed in linen. Who's the man dressed in linen? He sees an angel too, right? I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. And as he raised, look what he does. He raised his right hand and his left <laughs> toward heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever. Who did he swear by? Same person, right? Look what he says. And it would be for a time, times, and a half time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be complete. Now, we, for the sake of time, we're not going to go into the time, times, and a half time tonight. If you read the book of Daniel, there's some places in there where there's 1,290 days and different things like that. What he's talking about is the seven years of tribulation. Okay? Now, a time, times, plural, and a half time. So that's one time, two times, and a half times, three and a half times, right? That's half of the tribulation period. I personally think halfway through the tribulation period, as I said earlier, this is where we're at. I think John's seeing the same exact thing Daniel saw. Daniel just gives us a little bit of timeline. Because what happens next? Remember what happened last week? Who come out of the abyss besides the locusts? Who else came out? The demons. And who else? And who else? Actually, Satan was out. He's the one who let them out. The Antichrist. Okay? So, I see. Because so, here's the deal. 
Oh, well, you said, preacher, one of them horsemen was the Antichrist, the one that had the white horse. Remember him? The first horse? See, here's the deal. The Antichrist is going to come on the scene, and ain't nobody going to say, man, well, that's the devil spawn over there. <laughs> that ain't what they're going to do at all. He's going to be slick. How do you think he's going to get people to follow him? I, I can't prove it, but I think he's going to have the answer to the rapture. I think he's going to be able to have a reason. What happened to all them people that just disappeared from the face of the earth? I think he's going to have the answer. It's going to be a lie, but I think he's going to have an answer. Okay? You with me? I can't prove that in Scripture. This is just me thinking. Don't go tell everybody. If you're watching on the Internet, Preacher Bob said, I said it, but I can't prove it. That's just my opinion, okay? That's not... When I say this, this is uncompromising the truth. When I say this is my opinion, that's my opinion, that's all. That and seven bucks gets you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Okay? <laughs> that's all that's worth. <laughs> all right? But I think... See, so he's already going to be on the scene. He's already going to be politicking. He's already going to be setting up his government. All that's going to already... We've already read about some of this stuff. But now, God's done turned up the heat. So he's going to, too. Now people's going to say, man, that guy ain't a good dude after all. That peace treaty with Israel, at this point, that all goes out the window. I think that's where we're at in the text. I think what, what, what he sees is the same thing Daniel saw. Look at verse 9 in Daniel 12. I, I told you I had two verses I wanted you to look at. The other verse says, uh, And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. God showed Daniel something he didn't want revealed either until the end. Now, it, 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 I don't believe what he showed Daniel was was the same thing that, he, that these thunders that we don't know what were was. I think what he showed Daniel is some of the same stuff we've already learned about. But if you read the rest of Daniel, from that time the regular sacrifice is abolished, the abomination of desolation is set up, some, some say, well, the abomination of desolation took place in the, in, during the Hasmonean period, which is the 400 years between the Old and the New Testament. I'm sort of just teaching right here, so don't get lost in what I'm saying. If you don't understand some of this, we can talk later. But, 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 but what happens is, is they actually kill a pig on the altar in the temple during that time. That's desecrated the temple. So some would say that was the abomination of desolation. The problem I have with that is in the New Testament, Jesus still talks about that happening like it ain't happened yet. What's going to happen? We're going there. We're going there. Like I'm saying, we're three and a half years in now. The Antichrist is getting ready to desecrate the temple. And here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing. A lot of people, and a lot of people, more people, way smarter than me, believe this, that Revelation wasn't written until 90 A.D. A lot of people believe that. A lot of people. A lot of people way smarter than me. Okay? But I think it was written before 70. And the reason why is because the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70. And when John writes the Revelation, he looks at it and he don't see the temple as being gone. He don't, he, it don't even click with John that the temple ain't there. Now there's a few scholars that's way smarter than me that believe that too. <laughs> Just a few. I, I don't claim to know all the answers. I just find it interesting when we read the text that John, John don't act like the temple's gone. For those who are saved at this point in history, this just means the end's more near. We're just one day closer. Just one more day closer. That's all that means to us. But to our family, friends, and loved ones who don't know Jesus, if they're alive when this happens... You think the things I've described to you in the past weeks are bad. It's getting ready to get worse. When the seventh trumpet sounds, it will release the seven bold judgments. And like I said earlier, time will move rapidly. Go back to Revelation, and the Bible says 
in verse uh, in chapter ten. In verse 7, that the sound and the mystery of God is finished. The mystery of God. No more delay in the prophecy. It's going to happen. So at this point, the mystery of the rapture is a past event. The mystery of the Messiah and Israel's blindness is a past event. The mystery of the kingdom of heaven will no longer be a past event. The mystery of Christ in us and the mystery of the wisdom of God are all past events. And why God allows people to suffer that are his own in persecution and martyrdom, we won't question anymore. Why God allows Satan to destroy will no longer be a mystery. We'll know. The Bible says the mystery of God will be fulfilled at that point. Verse 8, and the angel takes the scroll, and I'm going to wrap this up with this. The angel takes the scroll, the little book that John saw earlier in the passage, and I said... I'll come back to that because here he, he deals with it. You know, up until this point, all through the Revelation, John's been watching and listening. Write what you hear. Write what you see. But now he's asked to participate. Hey, John, come and take the book. Take this little scroll from this angel's hand and eat it. Eat it? <laughs> yeah, eat it. Got any salt and pepper to crack her to go fat? Nah, just eat it. Verse 9, it will be to your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Has this ever happened? Well, I'm glad you asked. In Ezekiel chapter 3, turn there very quickly. I know it's 8 o'clock. We're going to wrap this up. I promise I'm about done. This is my last point. Ezekiel chapter 3. Listen to these words in Ezekiel 3, verse 1 and following. And then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I'm giving you. And then I ate it. And look what it says next. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. And then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but you're being sent to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples or unintelligible speech or difficult language whose words you cannot understand, but I have sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet, the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you since they're not willing to listen to me, capital M, God speaking. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, your forehead as hard as their foreheads, like emery, harder than flint. I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them or dismayed before them, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, take it into your heart, all my words which I speak to you, and listen closely. Go to the exiles, to the sons of your people, and speak to them and tell them whether they listen or not. Thus says the Lord. Ezekiel is commissioned by God. Ezekiel is commissioned by God to go to his people and proclaim the word. And God tells him they ain't going to listen. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, the last verse of the chapter, And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. God is still, with all that's happened, desiring for somebody to preach the Word. What saves men's souls? The Word of God. Nobody can be saved without the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's imperative. This is why when we go on trips, when we leave, we want to make sure everybody's got a copy, at least, of the New Testament 
in their hand, in their own heart language, we possibly can give it to them. Why? Because the Word of God is powerful. If they don't get saved when we preach to them, the Word of God still has the power to save people. There was a lady today. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to say all this without forwarding more information than I might or might not say. There was a young man a year or so ago in our church family who had built a relationship with a young lady overseas. She had shared the gospel. He had shared the gospel with this young lady, and she had not received Jesus as her Lord and Savior. This young man died of a massive heart attack. Now you all know who I'm talking about. This young lady watched his funeral live stream because David set it up where she could watch it. She bore testimony today in the church that she's attending today. This very day, she bore testimony. She watched that funeral and she was mad. She said, I can't understand why all they do was talk about Jesus. That preacher stood up there, that was me, and all he did was talk about Jesus. And I was mad. I didn't want to talk about Jesus. I wanted to talk about this young man who had just passed away. You would have been talking about him, not about Jesus. Well, the next day she was real mad. And she was praying, trying to pray. And she had a Bible and she opened the Word of God. And John's Gospel, chapter 14, spoke to her heart. And she fought and she struggled. And she began to watch our services online. And eventually, over time, communicating with Judy Lackey and myself and back and forth somewhere in that process, through the work of the Scripture and the Holy Spirit of God, this young lady gave her heart to Jesus. Sure did. And she reached out to me and said, Now I don't know what to do, Pastor. You want to know about the International Mission Board and why we give money to it? I called the International Mission Board. I got the young lady's address in England. I called the International Mission Board and found a church within seven miles of her house that was a Bible-preaching church. I gave the pastor her information and gave her the pastor's information, and I reached out to the pastor, and he said he would go visit her, and he did. She's been attending services for six months, and by the glory of God, today she was baptized at 2.30 p.m. for the glory of God in that church in England today. Why is that important? She picked up a copy of the Word of God, and it spoke to her heart. John is told... Don't just read it. Don't just proclaim it. Get it up inside of you. Eat it. And when you do, it's going to be two things. First of all, it's going to be sweet in your mouth when it's going down. But when it gets down in here, that sin is going to make it bitter in your stomach. And something's got to give, right? That's what John's told him. That's what Ezekiel did. That's what John did. And when he gets to that point, he has, then he is recommissioned to go proclaim the truth. He tells him, you take the same commission, Matthew 28, the same commission we have, right here. Go make disciples. Don't go make converts. Go make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is somebody who literally is taking the Word of God in and not doing like the people Ezekiel went to. God said, go preach to them. They ain't going to listen. They're stiff-necked. They're obstinate. I was reminded today when I was working on this, uh, I, was, I didn't finish this till this afternoon, and I was thinking about what Donald said in a leadership meeting over there last Saturday. Somebody made a comment about my teaching abilities, and I'm not... Trust me, this is not a pat on Bob's back. This is a commendation of, John, of, of Donald's prophecy. Not that he had a fresh word, he just seen what happened. And I said, well, I must not be that good a teacher. Because when I spill out the word, everybody don't listen. And Donald said, 
It's not on you. We just ain't obeying. And when I thought about Ezekiel today, God told him the same thing. You go preach the word, they ain't going to listen. I thought about when I accepted the call to preach in Isaiah 6. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I stood up and said, here I am, Lord, send me. Literally, I stood up and said those exact words that night. And I went home and I read that passage after that night, after I'd accepted the call to preach. <laughs> and I was reading the rest of the passage. And you know what? Isaiah and God had this conversation after that verse. I didn't know that that night when I raised my hand and stood up. God said the same thing to Isaiah. You're going to preach and people ain't going to listen. You think God knows what he's talking about? <laughs> Y'all sitting here looking at me like you're trying to say we are disobedient? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to have to fight my way out of here, all right? <laughs> Listen to me. I say this with love in my heart. I really do. I don't obey everything I read either. Sometimes I'm so disobedient I don't deserve to be able to stand in front of you and proclaim the truth. Here's what I know. Four things. God's in control. Even when hell breaks loose on earth, God's still in control. Number two, I don't have to know everything right now. God does. Number three, no matter what you're going through, one day it'll be over. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how bad it is, one day this will all speed up. It'll all go faster and it'll all be over. And lastly, like John, we've been commissioned to proclaim the Word of God. Not just preachers, followers of Jesus. We all have a call. So write that testimony. Let me help you use that and learn to use that as a tool over the next coming weeks of how you can use that to share your faith. Just like Paul did in the New Testament. Write it down. Think about it. You got a couple more days. If you really saved, you know what happened. You can remember it. For some of you, it might have been 40 years ago. For some of you, it might have been four months ago. I mean, you know, I'm a firm believer, though. This book will change your life. It will. It will. What needs to change in your life? What needs to change? Lord, we thank you for the scripture. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the, proof, the truth. And we thank you that even though we're obstinate and stiff-necked and hard-headed, hard-headed as flint sometimes, you love us anyway. You love us anyway. Let the word be sweet not sour in our belly. Help us to obey you. In Jesus' name.